Thank you, Dr. Hall, for those kind words. Thank you, John Austin, the President, Chief of Staff, who extended the invitation to preach on behalf of Dr. Moeller, and uh, what a great honor it is to be here. The Lord, uh, give me faithfulness to the text, fluency, and fervency. When you see a child angrily hit another child, over a dispute over a toy, what do you see there? Do you see a good-hearted child having a bad moment? Or do you see a child acting out of his or her own true nature? When on television you see a person in an orange jumpsuit charged with murder, do you see someone who, pressured by bad circumstances, possibly did something horribly wrong? Or do you see someone who, if guilty, only manifested something smoldering in their heart all their life? Some see people as mostly good at heart and that they do more or less good or more or less evil than other people. Now, they'll admit that even the best of people behind closed doors at least, will sometimes be selfish or rude or, or angry. They acknowledge that even the most gentle soul among us, when their new car is rammed in the rear, doesn't say, oh, heavens to Betsy, someone has hit my new car. I fervently hope they were able to finish that important text message. And I do hope that other drivers were not inconvenienced by my misfortune. No, that's unrealistic, and, but nevertheless, my impression is that most people see other people as generally well-intentioned and good at heart. But a minority, I believe, see the world as filled with people who are more or less bad, who nonetheless, obviously, do good things to a greater or lesser degree than others. Even Hitler, it is said, was good to his dog. The Bible says that someday we will all stand before God and give an account of our lives and everything we have done. And eternity in heaven or hell will be at stake, and in that most serious and solemn of moments, it will not matter what others think of us, but only what God thinks. He is the one who has seen everything we have done and known our thoughts and our motives. How will He view us? In His love and mercy, He has told us in advance what He thinks. The passage before us in the book of God is what God inspired the Apostle Paul to write in Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. It is not primarily about the last judgment, but the shadow of that day falls over the entire section. Now, let me tell you what I intended to do, but for lack of time, a few hours ago, decided not to do. Uh, my first point, really, was going to be what I call some commentary for context. And in going through the passage, I was going to give basically a running commentary of these 11 verses and come back and focus on a small part of that. But realizing how much time that would take, that that was three pages of my notes, uh, regrettably, I'm going to cut that out and hope to make up for some of it a little bit later on. So let me read with just a few comments, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, that's what the previous chapter is about. Thus, the therefore, it's about Abraham being justified by faith, not works, and we too likewise. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, Jesus, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, that we will stand before God in His glory. Not only that, 
But in the present time, right now, not just hope for the future. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, even the worst things now. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. When you stay faithful when it's hard and do so for a long time, that produces endurance, and endurance produces character, Christ-like character. It's easy to quit. Many have their faith tested and proven false by giving up when it's hard to stay faithful to Christ. When you endure, that proves a Christ-like character, and character produces hope. As you see a growing Christ-likeness in your life, it increases the hope, the, the solid hope that you do know God, you are going to heaven, and therefore hope does not put us to shame. At the judgment, we will not be put to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So in the subjective, in now, when we have this new love this God-like love for what God loves, a love for God's Word, a love for God's people, a love for God's will and His ways. We have hope that this is real, and we're going to stand at the judgment and go to heaven. For now a change happens, and the, it's not on the experiential side of our justification, but on this objective side, all this is built on these truths. For while we were weak... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die, but God. Now the great transition happens. But God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by His blood, declared righteous, much more shall we be saved from Him from the wrath of God. If we are justified now by the death of Christ, much more at the judgment, at the, the wrath to come, we will be saved from that. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? If his death reconciled us to God, his resurrection life is going to do even more. More than that, now we're back to the experiential. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, with that context, I want us to focus on four terms in verses 6 through 10 that describe the condition of people who have not been reconciled to God and grimly announce that outside of Christ, we are worse than we think we are. This is truthful but very bad news. But hold on. Good news is coming. So we are worse than we think we are. Four terms in this passage that describe the spiritual condition of those who have not experienced the transforming power of God's love through Jesus Christ. Terms which set forth the way God sees everyone of every ethnicity, young or old, religious or irreligious, those the world considers good and those the world considers bad who have not come to God through Jesus. That first term is weak. See it there in verse 6, while we were still weak, we were unable to do what we needed most to atone for our sins and make ourselves right with God. We had sinned against God, but we were too weak to do anything about it. We did not have the ability to do what God requires to keep His law perfectly, but we couldn't do it. The standard of a holy God is, be holy, for I am holy. But we couldn't stop sinning against Him. We could not keep God's holy standards we're worse than we think we are. Second term is ungodly. It's also there in verse 6. Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus died to bring people to God. But not good people. He didn't die for good people. For if there's a chance anyone could be good enough to get to heaven, God would not have sent his son. Jesus would not have died if there was a chance we could make it on our own. If people could be good enough for heaven, then as Paul said in Galatians 2.21, Christ died for no purpose. But he did die for a purpose, to save ungodly people. That is, people not like God. Ungodly, not like God. And at the judgment, 
God will not receive ungodly people into heaven. And God says that all without Christ are ungodly. Listen to what Paul says in Titus 3, 3, that, and this is about people uh, before they came to Christ, but who now are Christians. So even these people who are Christians, he said, you were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. This is ungodliness. And this is how everyone is before Christ's righteousness is given to them. We're worse than we think we are. The third term is sinners. It's in verse 8. You see that? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, Paul has just used an illustration in the text of how we will not die for a righteous person. Here it means a morally upright person, law keeper, good neighbor, pays his taxes. We won't die for someone like that but not even for a good person, he says. In this case, a a good in the eyes of other people, the kind of person that everyone is grieved when they die. But no one would die for even them. But Jesus died for sinners, it says here, for people who deserve their punishment. Sinners are people who have sinned. People who have broken the law of God, as the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus says, if you've been angry, you've broken the commandment, you shall not commit murder. If you've looked at someone lustfully, you've broken the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. At the judgment, God won't grade on the curve, allowing, well, those who have sinned a little less than others in and excluding those who've sinned a little more. The Bible says, interestingly, in James 2, verse 10, that if anyone keeps the whole law, imagine that, but fails in one point, he becomes accountable for all of it. In other words, to try to earn your way to heaven is like trying to climb to heaven on a long chain. And if by sinning you break one link in that chain, the whole thing falls away and you with it. One sin keeps you from heaven. And the fourth term is enemies in verse 10. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Until we come to Christ, we're actually opposed to God, hostile to God, it says. We don't want him to rule over us. We want to put other things in his place. We want to live our own lives, thank you very much, and do what we want to do even if we know God would have us do something else. This is why we break his law. This is why we sin. God is our enemy, and we have made him so. We are worse than we think we are. All this is a description of our natural condition, apart from Christ and the Holy Spirit. Even even though every person is made in the image of God, we've disfigured that image by sin into something ungodly. This is summarized in the theological term, Depravity. The Bible's doctrine of depravity doesn't teach that we are worthless, doesn't teach that we can do no good, but it does teach that we are not worthy of living in a perfect world and we cannot do enough good to get to heaven and impress God. By just the sixth chapter of the Bible, the Lord announces his evaluation of what people are like without him. Genesis 6, 5, perhaps the classic text in the Bible on depravity, the Lord saw. He looked upon earth. He looked into people's hearts. What did he see? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Analyze that backward. Continually. Without stop. It was evil. Mixed? No, it was only evil continually. That's what was in his heart. Well, not just in the heart, in the thoughts of the heart. And not just the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. The intention of the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. Moreover, every intention of the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. That's what the text says the Lord saw. 
We may not see that. We may disagree with that. But when the Lord looks, by His holy standards, that's what He sees. And this depravity wasn't washed away by the Genesis flood. By the time of the prophets, thousands of years later, we're no better. As Isaiah wrote, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are as a polluted garment. Many of us learned that as even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, literally, like a dirty diaper. And what's it speaking of? Our sins? No, we know those are polluted. It says, even our righteous deeds, those times when we do what is right. In some sense, God is pleased with that, that we do what is right as opposed to what is wrong. But we need to recognize that even when we do what is right, from God's holy perspective, it's like a dirty diaper. We're worse than we think we are. The Bible repeats the same words three times, first by David, then Isaiah, then by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, 6, or 10, and 12. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And the Apostle Paul, even the Apostle in the very uh, two chapters later, Romans 7, 16 for, says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. So even people born again, given a new heart, where the love of God has written the law of God on our hearts and on our minds, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, the love of God poured out in our hearts, as our text here, Romans 5 says, we still have in our flesh, that is, that part of us in this Life that still finds sin appealing, still finds temptation attractive. In that part of us, Paul says, there is nothing good dwelling there. Nothing. And then some years later, when he's near the end of his life, when he's arguably the most Christ-like man who's ever walked on this earth other than Jesus, Paul says of himself in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He didn't say that for effect. He really meant it. He believed himself to be the biggest sinner in the world because as, as he con considered himself that, that he has had these appearances of Jesus to him. He's had the ultimate human experience where he was unable to go to heaven. He's had miracles come coursing through his hands. And despite all the unparalleled experiences with God that he has had and seen and God has done for him, he would look at himself and say, but I still sin every single day. How is that possible? Anyone who can still sin in spite of all that God has done to me or for me, I must be the worst sinner in the world. I once heard... Dallas Seminary professor John Hanna say, the closer one comes to Christ, in one sense, the more miserable he becomes. Because the more you know Christ and the better you understand the holiness of God, the more sensible you are of your own unholiness. In Jonathan Edwards' personal narrative, my favorite of all his works, he wrote about how he came to see the depth of what he was apart from God's grace. My wickedness, as I am in myself, has long appeared to me perfectly ineffable. In other words, I no words to describe it. And infinitely swallowing up all thought and imagination, like an infinite deluge or infinite mountains over my head. I know not how to express better what my sins appear to me to be. And this is one of the most famous lines in all of Edward's literature. Then by heaping infinite upon infinite and multiplying infinite by infinite. I go about very often for this many years with these expressions in my mind and in my mouth, infinite upon infinite, infinite upon infinite. When I look into my heart, and take a view of my wickedness, it looks like an abyss infinitely deeper than hell. And it appears to me that were it not for free grace, exalted and raised up to the infinite height of all the fullness and glory of the great Jehovah, 
and the arm of his power and grace stretched forth in all the majesty of his power and in all the glory of his sovereignty. I should appear sunk down in my sins, infinitely below hell itself, far beyond sight of everything but the piercing eye of God's grace that can pierce even down to such a depth and to the bottom of such an abyss. Apart from God's grace, we are capable of far worse than most of us imagine ourselves to be. In Deuteronomy 28, 52 to 55 is really one of the most disgusting passages in the Bible. God told Israel if they forsook him, which he knew they would do, then enemies would come and besiege them and the suffering would be so great they would turn to cannibalism. And they shall besiege you in all your towns, throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you, in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. The man who is the most tender and refined among you will begrudge food to his brother, to his wife he embraces, and to the last of the children whom he has left. And. On more than one occasion in the history of Israel, that's exactly what they did. Why would God put something like that in the Bible? To demonstrate a very important truth that we would never see otherwise, perhaps, that we are worse than we think we are. You might say, I I could never do that. I could never do that. Do you think if you had gone to these parents before the siege started and asked them if they were capable of doing that, do you think any of them would have said yes? Of course not. They love their children as much as we do. But God knew if the circumstances were tough enough, that's exactly what they would do. We have no idea of the depths of depravity to which we can go under the right conditions. Throughout history, we have seen that if people get hungry enough, they will put their own survival above everyone else's. If people get angry enough, they will murder. If people get tempted beyond a certain point, get pressured beyond a certain point, or get desperate enough, they will do things that under normal conditions they would say they would never do. There are circumstances we've not yet encountered, conditions we've not yet envisioned, pressures we've not yet known Hunger, we've not yet seen. Degrees of temptation, we've not yet felt. And depths of anger or hopelessness or pain, we've never experienced that would result in each of us doing things we've never done and cannot imagine ourselves doing. As we're worse than we think we are. But in our text, we also have what might be called the great adversative. An adversative is a grammatical term which, according to the dictionary, quote, expresses opposition or antithesis. The Greek word here, Allah, means on the other hand, and is usually translated in English as one little, even smaller word than in Greek, but. Yes, the Bible says we are worse than we think we are, but here comes the great adversative in verse 8. The greatest adversative phrase in the Bible. The greatest of all possible adversatives, but God. See it there at the beginning of verse 8? But God. At the bottom of human depravity, even at the lowest point The worst of human sin, when our spiritual condition could not have been worsened, when we could do nothing to help ourselves, when we could do nothing but despair, there is this, but God. From those two little words, the light of divinity begins to shine on the darkness of depravity. Those two little words are the foundation of all our hope, 
Those two little words are the great hinge of all of history. Our preacher hero of the 20th century, Martin Lloyd-Jones, said these two words in and of themselves contain the whole of the gospel. Yes, we are weak, ungodly, sinners, and enemies, but God. Now the focus changes from our weakness to God's power, from our ungodliness to God Himself, from our sin to God's salvation, and from our enmity to God's love. And it has always been this way. The whole world was covered with water. Noah and his small family were in the ark. What possible hope is there in that? What can you do? (laughs) Where can you go? It's hopeless. But God, Genesis 8, 1 says, remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. David was on the run, hiding from place to place in the wilderness, in caves. And 1 Samuel 23, 14 says, and Saul, that's the king, sought him every day. But God did not give him into his hand. In Psalm 73, you'll read some uh, from Asaph expressing some of the deepest discouragement found in the Bible. But in verse 26, he affirms, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In Acts 7, verse 9, Stephen is recounting the history of Israel, and he writes, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. What a hopeless situation. A slave in a foreign land, all alone. No one cares. No one knows you. Then unjustly put in a horrible prison. What hope is there? There's no one who can help him. There's no one who cares about him. Then Stephen adds, But God was with him, and that changed everything. In Acts 10, 39 through 40, Peter is preaching to Cornelius and other Gentiles for the first time and says of Jesus, they put him to death by hanging him on the tree. Oh, no, that's the end. But God raised him from the dead. In Acts 13, 28 through 30, Paul is preaching and says of Jesus, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. End of story, right? But God raised him from the dead. Perhaps the best known but God passage and the one most like Romans 5 is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 7. Notice this downward spiral, then the great hinge of history. Paul says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, and the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. The rest of mankind, all this is true of the best of humanity. That's why I say we are worse than we think we are. Down, 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 dead in trespasses and sins. But God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. All of our hope is in these two little words, but God. Knowing everything about us, knowing every sin we would ever commit, knowing sins we don't even know we've committed, knowing every sin we would commit if we just had the right opportunity, the right temptations, the right pressures, knowing all of this. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are worse than we think we are. 
But because of God, we have Jesus. And my last point is this. Jesus is better than we think he is. We are worse than we think we are. But Jesus is better than we think he is. Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5 says. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved by him from the wrath of God. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. The Apostle John writes this in 1 John 5, 11 and 12, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Jesus is better than we think he is. Jesus is life, life for the weak, life for the ungodly, life for the sinners, life even for enemies of God. Jesus is life, and everywhere he went, there was life. Life flowed from him so much that throngs of people crowded around him just to touch him. In Mark 6, 53 and 50 through 56, we're told, when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, I never noticed this verse, though I'd literally read it over a hundred times. I never noticed this verse until preparing for this message. And wherever he came, in villages, in cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Why? Because they were touching life. You, you can imagine how the medical conditions were in those days. If you got sick, there's very little help available to you. Then people hear of this Galilean man who can heal anyone of anything, even raise the dead. So people came from everywhere. And whether he was in small villages, whether he was in big cities, even in the countryside, there were these throngs of people trying to touch him. So many people came from everywhere. I mean, if you had a dying child, you'd walk over the top of your best friend to get that baby to Jesus, wouldn't you? Why? Because they were touching life. And so that's what people did by the thousands. If, if you had a drone and could see this thing from the air, it, it must have looked, as, even in the countrysides, wide open spaces, like a swarm of bees on the move. And at the center, Jesus, like the queen bee, is there. And, and other bees are either trying to get to him or, or, or protect him. It was just this moving mass of people, everyone pressing forward, pressing forward. Jesus, Jesus, heal my baby. Jesus, heal me. Day and night, desperate people doing whatever it took to get to Jesus. In Luke 8, 45, after the woman with a discharge of blood came up in the crowd behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment and was healed, Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And the disciples, Mark tells us it was Peter, said to him, you see the crowd? around, pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? <laughs> Everyone was trying to touch Jesus. Everyone. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the 12 disciples most of those days? Most of their time must have spent just trying to keep people from crushing Jesus. Get back, get back. Let the man through, let the man through. People are reaching and handing their babies to Jesus and with all their might pushing to get there. And they're all day long trying to hold people back and let him through. Have you ever wondered what the disciples did when they got sick? I wonder what Peter did when he got a cold. Man, I picked up a terrible cold today. It's no wonder with all these sick people surrounding us from sun up to sundown and the smell. Do these people ever take a shower? I tried to avoid the germs. Man, I ran out of hand sanitizer after about the 10th leper he cleansed. <laughs> hey, Philip, you have any NyQuil I can borrow? 
Did John say to him, dude, whatever dude is in Aramaic, as, <laughs> as Dr. Gentry, dude, just go touch Jesus. When he's asleep, just sneak over and touch the hem of his garment. We have no record of this, of course, but John did write, 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word. What do you call him? Concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. After Pentecost, they must often have looked at their hands and they said, we touched God. The, these hands touched God. The ones who touched him were healed and the one they touched was life. And when they believed in him, they received eternal life. Jesus is life. You realize he could have walked through a desert and it would have, he, it could have bloomed behind him. We've no record of this, but we do have prophecies of how he would make the desert bloom. Isaiah 35, 1 and 2 says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. That's Jesus. Wherever Jesus passed in the desert of humanity, that did happen. Withered hands were restored like, like blossoms on trees. Dry, dead, moistened eyes blossomed into sight. Stiff, paralyzed quadriplegics blossomed into full strength. Skin desiccated by leprosy blossomed into full health. In the desert of death, Corpses bloom to life at his touch. And even more important is that spiritually that's what happened. Wherever Jesus went, those who were dead spiritually blossomed with eternal life. And they all rejoiced just as the prophet said the desert would. But he literally could have walked through a desert and it just bloomed like the Garden of Eden behind him because he created it. He is life. He is God. And Jesus said, speaking of the Holy Spirit, that when we are united with him by faith, rivers of living water flow into and out of our hearts. And he said that all who come to him receive life, abundant life, eternal life. This is the one who died for us while we were weak, ungodly, sinners, and enemies. This is from my favorite of the prayers in the book, The Valley of Vision. My Father, enlarge my heart, warm my affections, open my lips, supply words that proclaim love lusters at Calvary. There, infinite punishment was due and infinite punishment was endured. Christ was all anguish, that I might be all joy. Cast off, that I might be brought in. Trodden down as an enemy, that I might be welcomed as a friend. Surrendered to hell's worst, that I might attain heaven's best. Stripped, that I might be clothed. Wounded, that I might be healed. A thirst, that I might drink. Tormented, that I might be comforted. Made a shame, that I might inherit glory. Entered darkness, that I might have eternal light. My Savior wept, that all tears might be wiped from my eyes. Groaned, that I might have endless song. Endured all pain, that I might have unfading health bore a thorny crown that I might receive a glory diadem, bowed his head that I might uplift mine, experienced reproach that I might receive welcome, 
closed his eyes in death that I might gaze on unclouded brightness, expired that I might forever live. O Father, who spared not your only Son that you might spare me, all this transfer your love designed and accomplished. Friends, we are worse than we think we are. But Jesus is better than we think he is. I invite you to respond to this message. Respond, first of all, by believing. Believing that it's all true. If you never come to Christ, you are weak. You are ungodly. You're a sinner. You're an enemy of God. The world may tell you that you are by nature a good person, but God says you are worse than you think you are, and it's good for you to believe that. It's good for you to believe that. It's good to believe that because it helps you finally give up on the impossibility of being good enough to stand before a holy God at the judgment. Joseph Hart's classic 1759 hymn, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy, has this great line, Let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness good enough for God, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is that you feel your need of him. When you realize you're worse than you think you are and feel your need of him, he will welcome you. He is ready to receive you. So believe that it's also true that while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly like you. Believe that God shows his love for us and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for sinners like you. Believe that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, even enemies like you. Second way to invite you to respond is to respond by rejoicing. Rejoicing because it's all true. Rejoice, as verse 2 in this passage says, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Believer, before long you're going to see the smiling face of God, the smiling face of an indescribably glorious God. You will experience a glory that's beyond your wildest imagination. You will live in delight forever in a place with a beauty you have no capacity yet to envision. And God will make you unendingly happy. Happy there, infinitely beyond the greatest moment of happiness you have ever known in this life. And knowing all this to be true and not far away, let it help you rejoice even in your sufferings, as verse 3 says, because no matter what happens to you in this world, these great things can never be taken from you. And every day of your suffering means you're one day closer to that glory, to the hope of the glory of God in all its fullness. And rejoice, as verse 11 says, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You have now received reconciliation, the Bible says. Your name is written in heaven, believer, and it is unerasable. Third and finally, respond by praying. Respond by praying a but God prayer. Christian, where is your life most hopeless? Where in your life are the circumstances most impossible? Where are you most discouraged, most desperate? Remember verse 8, but God. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When our natural condition, our eternal condition was beyond all human hope, there was this, but God. And he poured out his love in the most possible, greatest possible way by sending his son for us. And if he did that, if he showed up in your greatest need and poured out his love, he's able to do that in every other need in your life. Go into the midst of your most helpless situation and pray a but God prayer. We are worse than we think we are. Yet there is this, but God. And Jesus is better than we think he is. As the hymn says, though our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Let's pray. 
Oh God, thank you for the great message of the gospel. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and the great love that sent him. Thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to come. Come for the weak, the ungodly, for sinners, for your enemies. And by your spirit, I pray you'd make Jesus irresistibly beautiful to every person here. I ask it in his name and for your glory. Amen.